Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll take a look at interactive maps that display detailed information about the Phoenix area. And we'll speak with a Glendale City Councilman about Super Bowls, Pro Bowls, and the possibility of a nearby tribal casino. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. An administrative law judge today recommended that campaign finance allegations against Attorney General Tom Horn and an aide, Kathleen Wynne, be dismissed. The judge said that Yavapai County prosecutors failed to show that Horn illegally coordinated with an independent expenditure committee run by Wynn to raise and spend $500,000 in the waning days of the 2010 attorney general's race. Now, the Yavapai County Attorney's Office can either reject, accept, or otherwise change the judge's recommendation. A rejection sends the case to Maricopa County Superior Court. The Maricopa Association of Governments has created several interactive demographic maps of the Phoenix metro area. The maps allow for a variety of searches for information ranging from land use and population density to bikeways and much more. Anna Bob Bagley is MAG's Information Services Manager. He joins us right now. It's good to have you here. You and your computer are both here to Thank you, kind of take us through all this. Interactive maps of the Phoenix area. What are we talking about here? So we're talking about there's a lot of data sets that we all have. You have, as a regional agency, we have a ton of data that's related to demographics, land use, and all of these other pieces. And so we've put tools online that anybody in the public can go in, use these tools to create maps, reports, analysis on their own. This helps supporting all kinds of activities, regional planning, economic development, any of those pieces can be done right there at your computer using latest data that's available. So everyone from neighborhood and city activists and businesses looking for some information on what a neighborhood offers, it's all right there. It's all right there. We've had these websites on for quite some time. Interestingly, we had built a mapping application like this about 10 years ago. This was before Google and Bing came up and started becoming so popular. At that time, our biggest thing was we have a lot of data. We were getting a lot of people calling in for requests for customized maps, et cetera. We would do that, but this was kind of to help us, help everybody else to go in and create their own maps and analysis. And, and, and things so, have developed here over the years, correct? Things have completely changed over the years. We built these about one and a half, two years ago. Uh, a lot of this work has been primarily done within our agency itself. We've got a wonderful team that has helped us build these. And we've built these tools with the idea that the look and feel is a lot like Google and Bing Maps, things that people are now very used to using. But on top of just your standard map itself, now you've got data to look at. If you wanted to see what types of age groups or what is the type of population, zoom into a particular neighborhood, we've built those tools that's available to everybody online on our website. Well, let's take a look at, show us what you got here. We'll kind of take a bird's eye view in more ways than one of, of these maps, and then we'll kind of focus in on certain demographics. But uh, give us a, an introduction here. Sure, absolutely. So the first map that I've got up here is our demographic maps. It's coming off from the census data. What's very interesting interesting with the census data is that census data has now become, there's a lot of different details and nuances to census data itself. You've got different products that come out on an ongoing basis. So this map is basically showing for the two county, Maricopa and Pinal County, total population. The darker colors are the larger numbers of population. So the darker colors here, by the darker orange, is about 3,800 to 7,200 population in those block groups. Now the map system, you could zoom in right there within that thing. You can just see what, where this population is. I'm zooming into central Phoenix. This is I-17 right here, 101, 202 right here. So you can start looking into the different areas as you want. You can also have imagery behind this data set itself, but I'll bring that up a little later. But the other piece is we've got about 50 some different types of maps. If you look on the left side on the list under maps, you've got different types of map systems here. We can look at total population, age, so you've got different age groups, median age, age under different groups itself, population by race, percent white, black, Asian, Native American, etc. You can start looking at population by ethnicity, percent Hispanic, where is that population? At the click of a button now, suddenly your map has changed. You've got the different map of this is showing the Hispanic population. What are the different percentages? So the darker colors is a higher Hispanic population concentration in that area. And some of those outlying areas now, I think that people might get a little confused, but there's, some of those look like there's a, a higher population density. What does that, that mean? Well, the higher density, this is really just looking at the numbers itself. The number is dependent on the size of the area. So if the higher area, this area here yes. on the left starts looking at a higher number, but the density there is lower because the land area is much higher. 
So the number of people may be larger, but that is because just the land area for that block group. Census oh, data comes okay. in by block I got groups. You. I got you. If it's larger, that number is also larger. Go back to age, if you would, because I think that's that's fascinating to see. I would imagine Sun City, Youngtown, Surprise area, you yes. would probably have an older demographic there. What, what yes. do we got here? So right here, you can see that this is the median age. Median age is the average, just not the mean, but the median age. What is the about the median age for this area? And you start seeing that the darker areas, as you said, Sun City, Sun City West, Sun Lakes, are all in the darker area of 61 to 83. Now, Ted, one of the cool things we recently built, because we had, when, these, when we built these maps, we had done them with the idea that if somebody asked us to build, to color and everything else, we would do that. But hey, you don't like greens. Greens is not your thing. We can <laughs> let you go ahead and change that, and that, oh that does goodness. right there. There you go. You can change the types of categories right here. You can go sure. in and see how many different. Hey, it's five, it's two, two less for you. You can see more in there. What about satellite imagery? Can we see what's actually oh, on the ground? Absolutely. So I was talking about that. So let's zoom in. We were talking about Sun City, Sun City West. As you zoom in, you start seeing more of the streets and everything else. I can bring in aerial imagery here and take this transparency. You can see that. And if you start zooming in, you can you go. Can, you can almost see your house here. Very, you? You can, very, very close. You you're can surrounded see. by a bunch of folks who are either just like you or not quite like absolutely, you, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. This is fat. And what else you got here? Give us some more examples here. This is, I love maps and I love this stuff. This is great. So the other pieces we have, so I've looked at, so let's say you were looking at percent population 18 to 34, where is my working age or the younger working age population? 35 to 49, as you change these maps, you'll see the legends changing, you'll see the different things, this piece here where we see these colors, et cetera, we call it a legend and that's, you know, what are the different data sources behind it? You get to see that. You can see all kinds of stuff. So let's say you wanted to get into from a workforce development for economic development. Yes. Education attainment becomes a big thing. So yes. let's say you're interested in finding out where are the population with a bachelor's degree? Where is my education level? What is my education level on that? So you start seeing that piece right here. This is the education levels. So the darker blue 30 is 35 to 57. So all these areas have 35 to 57% of the population with a bachelor's degree. Whereas if you wanted to look what is about it with the associate's degree or something else, you can look at that. If you wanted to see household income, that's another piece that we keep getting asked for. So let's say you wanted to see what is the median income, and then you'll start seeing the different areas light up with the higher income versus the lower income and everything else, you see that. So the uses of this application from a mapping perspective is for regional planning, long range planning, et cetera. Human services started using it, but the big piece really is from an economic development perspective. I can so, see the economic development perspective. The human services, you actually have where service agencies or, or I don't know, hospitals, churches, schools, are they located on this as well? Not on this particular application. If you have the time, I could jump to another one, but off of our website, we have seven live viewers. Oh, the look yeah. and feel of these viewers is exactly the same. So if you've learned to use one, you can use all of these. So one of the viewers is called a landmark viewer, and that one has all kinds of information, schools, public libraries, police stations, fire stations, all of that is existing in that. The other piece about this is that this is not just a mapping application. So one of the pieces you could do with a map is you wanted to create a map and you've decided this is a map, you can click on this button, print a map right up top. I won't take this, this takes a couple of seconds, but right there, this is the map that it will print for you to take this down and you can put that in a presentation. Oh my goodness. But the other cool fact is that we've built something that this is beyond just mapping. So you wanted to know more about, let's say you wanted to know more about Phoenix or Tempe. You can click this, see what is going on with Phoenix. That gets you all kinds of charts and data sets. So here's the population by age for Phoenix, what's happening, age groups, race, what's happening on the race side, what's happening on ethnicity. The fact that a large percentage of population in Phoenix is Hispanic, 599,000, 40.8% of Phoenix is Hispanic population. Is that the overall Phoenix? Can you, can you get like a little subset of a map and get those same pie charts for that subset? Right, you're asking that. So there is a custom Thing here, you can start zooming in. You've decided that this is the particular neighborhood in Phoenix that you're interested in looking at. Yes. You can go in and select this area right here and say, that's the area I'm interested in finding out. It'll oh select that goodness. area for you. It'll give you the charts for that. You see all the charts with this, but the other piece is you get to see a summary report with all the data. You can download the data in Excel because we were getting a lot of requests from grant writers, from economic development professionals, from planners from our member agencies to try and get all of this data. This is available to you at the click of a button. You also get to see if you're really a geek like me, then you get to see all kinds of data in terms of the detailed block group data. 
right there. Uh, it's, it's, it's sens uh, any sensitive information that uh, was left out of this? Because it seems like you know an awful lot about all of us through this, this is This is a lot of data, but luckily yeah. this is all publicly available data sets. Census information. Census information yeah. that is available, it's being updated. It's just that it's not been packaged in a way that one can now look at this right away and start putting stuff, stuff together. So someone watching right now says, I need to check out these maps and I want to see what's there. First of all, where do they go? Mm -hmm. Where do they go? They go to our main website. It's our www.azmag.gov. And on there, on the top left side, there's an interactive maps link. And you can go to that, and that gets you to the website right there. Okay, and, and then once they're there, uh, they, they can do everything that you have just done here. They can print out, they can do the pie charts, the whole nine yards. They can do everything and more. They can print reports, those reports that I was showing you. Uh, they can print those reports and that come out to you. You can download those. There are seven viewers. We have an employment viewer, so we maintain an employment database of all employers of five or more at any location. So this gets you that information. You can start looking at for Tempe or a particular area, what are the largest employers? How big are they? You know, where, what is the sectorized employment? Again, from an economic development perspective, long range planning, that is the kind of data that we really need. And you can, you can look at housing values and percent owner occupied, those sorts of things as well. Yes, you can look at housing values. There's median housing value, there's gross rent. Owner occupied data, we have actually, we do have percent owner occupied and renter occupied too, all coming from the census. And the beauty of this is this data set, as needs come in, we've actually added on these data sets because census has a lot more data than just this. So we've added in more things and we keep modifying these applications. So the first version, did not have these advanced options and all of those things. Now we've made this, this is a mobile. This, this viewer, actually you could use it on your mobile device, whether well, it's an Android or iPad, you can use that. I was going to ask real quickly, last question here, do I need a special computer? Do I need special software? Can I just fire up the iMac and there you go? For this particular, the demographic viewer, there you go, you could just fire it up and it works. There are a couple of our viewers that currently need a software called Silverlight. It's a freely available application, it's just that you have to download it and install it. Now that is available to you, but our plan is slowly we are phasing those viewers out yeah. and we're building these new viewers in. So my technical team, which is amazing, they are building those things as we speak. Well, Anabab, it's, it's really fascinating stuff. Congratulations to you and the folks over at MAG for this. And I'm sure, as you said, it'll be developing uh, as time goes on. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ted. Thanks a lot. On the southwest corner of Mill Avenue and Rio Salado Parkway in downtown Tempe is a monument commemorating Hayden's Ferry. Today, the nearby Salt River is restrained by dams and spanned many places by bridges. However, when Charles Trumbull Hayden arrived in 1870, the salt was free-flowing and often turbulent. Hayden established a ferry to transport people, wagons, and materials across. The cable ferry derived its power from the river itself. Early immigrants called the emerging settlement Hayden's Ferry until 1877 when the name was changed to Tempe. Hayden would build a house and flour mill, remnants of which stand today. His son Carl would become one of Arizona's most influential senators, and bridges would become the preferred mode of crossing the salt. But for Tempe, Hayden's Ferry is where it all began. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. Glendale will play host to both the Super Bowl and the Pro Bowl next year. Is the city ready for the big events? And is Glendale ready for the possibility of an Indian gaming casino on land adjacent to the city? Glendale Councilman Samuel Shavira is here to provide us with some of those answers. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Let's talk about the football games and the fun stuff. Then we'll get to the casino where all the fussing Perfect. and fighting seems to be. Uh, your thoughts on the Pro Bowl announcement here recently? Well, um, 
I'm very happy that uh, our city uh, fought really hard. It was a, a competitive bid process. Um, now we're going to be hosting not only the Super Bowl, but a week before we'll be hosting the Pro Bowl. Um, it's a very unique dis distinction. Uh, there's only been two other cities that have ever hosted a Super Bowl and a Pro Bowl, and that was Los Angeles in 1967, and that was Miami in 2010. Now, is Glendale ready for both of these events? I mean, this is, this is a lot of stuff, and I know that there are concerns regarding public safety costs and reimbursement and these sorts of things. Where do we stand on this? Well, I'll tell you what. L let me tackle the part about being ready first. Uh, we helped expedite not only with MAG, uh, not only with the uh, MDOT and uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation. We just completed a third point of access. That's the Maryland, Maryland on-ramp through the HOV lane, uh, which gives us three points of access to bring people to uh, the Sports and Entertainment District, which is in Westgate. But not only that, but it also provides an ingress, a third point of ingress and egress for public safety. So we've expedited that just for these big events. Now, I know that there was a request for $2 million for public safety costs. Yes, sir. Uh, where does that stand? Well, right now, that is our Omega Events Bill. It's uh, and right now in the state legislature. In fact, it is right now, it is in the Senate Rules Committee. Uh, so when it uh, passes there, it'll go to the Senate, then it'll go uh, back to the, um, uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, right now where we're at with that, that's going to help us offset quite a bit of costs for public safety. Uh, you know, because I'm going to go all the way back to 9-11 uh, and I'll go back to uh, the Boston bombing. Ever since then, we've, we've had to be ever cognizant of the safety we provide for, for these big events. And that's what I was going to ask. I mean, $2 million for both of these major, is that enough? Well, this is it. Uh, it certainly doesn't cover all the costs, but what it does, since the, uh, the state, the valley benefits from these big events, it helps offset the costs that we need. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a $2 million cap, but what it does, it, it helps us offset our costs quite a bit. I've heard some rumblings, some from folks in Glendale and observations from them, some who aren't in uh, Glendale, that the city seems to be left out especially of the Super Bowl festivities, and that uh, they're not too happy about that. How do you feel about that? Well, I tell you what, I think we made it up by bringing in the Pro Bowl. You're talking about one game, one game that uh, features the best players in all the NFL. The Super Bowl, you have two, you have the, of course, you have the, the two top teams in the Super Bowl, but what's really unique about the Pro Bowl, if you've ever seen it in Hawaii, it's a beautiful place to be, and I would love to be in Hawaii, but the stands are, are rarely full. Now we have an opportunity because, you know, the, the current N, uh, NFL champions are the Seattle Seahawks. So now we have the ability, because of proximity, to bring people from all the West Coast. They'll come here, and the really beautiful part about that, it's a very affordable game. But is there anything being done in Glendale to get those folks to stay in Glendale instead of going to downtown Phoenix or, in previous years, to uh, Scottsdale? Well, absolutely. I, th this is it. Is you have to look at it from two different points of view. One, of course, we want them to stay in Glendale, but at the end of the day, the, this benefits the uh, the whole valley, the, uh, the the entire state. But the thing is, when people can find out, if they want to find out what to do in Glendale, they can visit our website, visit visitglendale.com, and it'll drive people to all the events we're having in Glendale. Last question on this: How do you quantify the benefit of a Super Bowl, of a Pro Bowl? How do you know that this is worth it? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, one of the ways you know it's worth it is how can you put a price tag? You're going to have the Pro Bowl, which is going to be seen internationally. You have uh, the Super Bowl seen internationally. From a marketing standpoint, when they show our city hosting those two events, how can you put a price tag on being able to afford something like that? I mean, now the whole world knows where Glendale's at, where Arizona's at. Is everyone on the council and the city government kind of on that page, or is there a little rumbling going on? Well, no, absolutely. I, I, I would think that we're all on the same page because the more, you, the more people we can get to come to our city and spend, spend money here, we all benefit. Okay, I know not everyone's on the same page regarding this Indian casino. <laughs> Give us the status now of what's happening with the Hono Odom and, and the idea of 95th Avenue and Northern, yes. this turning into an Indian gaming casino. Well, I want to thank you for that beautiful transition, that beautiful segue. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, well, this, this is where we're at. Uh, for four and a half years, approaching five years, uh, it was a non-issue. Uh, the uh, city of Glendale is still currently in a lawsuit. But what has changed since then is that we have uh, given formal direction to enter into dialogue. Uh, now we're actually sitting down, we're talking for the first time in five years, and you know just as anyone else, whenever you have a dialogue, um, you find out 
There might be a person that, that you've never known or you heard about them, and when you sit down and talk, you find out you have the same needs and the same wants. And that's where we're at right now. Why the change? Why the dialogue? Why now? Well, you know, at the end of the day, um, this is a great opportunity. Not only will it benefit the city of Glendale, it'll benefit the whole West Valley. We have an opportunity to have dialogue and uh, enter into that dialogue where we can see an economic benefit for everyone. The, uh, the uh, uh, Congress, there's a bill retroactive, I think, to April of 2013, expires, I think, in 2027, something like Trent Franks. Yes, sir. Representative Franks is sponsoring this bill. That would uh, specifically block Indian casinos, Phoenix area Indian casinos. Now, it sounds to me as though what was once a bill that Glendale city officials would support, you know, not all that supportive of this thing. What happened here? Well, actually, uh, let's be more specific. It's H.R. 1410. And it was, um, it was a bill that would uh, prohibit any casinos being built for the next 12 years during the current compact. Uh, the reason why uh, myself and my peers opted to uh, pass a resolution uh, to oppo formally oppose H.R. 1410 is with our current dialogue we're having right now, if it turns out to be fruitful and we pen a deal that's absolutely the best deal we can ever pen, if this, if this legislation were, were to happen to take place, it would block that. So we would, we would, at the end of the day, have an empty lot for 12 years. Yeah. Um, I know that there's some concern regarding land use. And uh, again, we're talking public safety concerns, everything from you know, PD and fire to sewer lines and all that kind of business. Yes, are, you, are, are these parts of the negotiations that you're talking about? Like, yes, sir. How do, you, how do you get that infrastructure done? Well, this, you, have, you have to remember, uh, this, the West Valley Resort Casino is going to be in the middle of two, uh, uh, two entertainment districts. Uh, uh, Peoria is all the way from the Peoria Sport com Complex all the way down the Camelback Ranch. So right now where they're going to be is the infrastructure is already in place. Um, as far as public safety, as far as tapping into that infrastructure, uh, the nation would pay for any costs incurred. And from the first moment they put a, the, the shovel blade in the ground mm -hmm. to turn the soil, they're investing a half a billion dollars into that property. So water and sewer issues really aren't much of an issue? Well, the thing is, anything can be settled at the table. That can be settled with the intergovernmental agreement. And that's what, that's, yeah, that's what hopefully that, that'll come out of, of, having, you know, um, of having dialogue. I know the Supreme Court's looking at a Michigan case regarding uh, sovereignty and, and these sorts yes, of things. Sir. So that suit kind of is in there. But still, there are those who say, you know, that this, this still goes against... I can't believe I'm, I'm asking someone from the city of Glendale to defend the casino here, but uh, they're saying this goes against the compact, that this is just not right. How, how well, do you see that? Well, what makes this unique, you have to remember, um, the uh, Tohono O'odham Nation lost countless acres of land when the Painted Rock, Painted Rock Dam was flooded. And because of now having the ability to land swap, they can purchase unincorporated land. And that's the thing, that's the issue. They're not buying land inside Glendale proper. It's unincorporated. It has never been annexed by us. And once they purchase that land, then they can appeal to the Department of Interior uh, to have it put into trust. And then it becomes then right. it, it becomes reservation. Yeah, and again, we'll, we'll see how, how much that uh, sovereignty applies here. For Absolutely. those in the area, businesses uh, who aren't happy about this idea, who say they are going to lose business because of a casino being there, you say? I say that I did what any person in office should do. Talk to the people that are going to be affected by this, and I have. And I, spoke, I have spoken to everyone at Westgate uh, in proximity to, uh, to the West Valley Resort Casino and my constituents. And is overwhelmingly, they, they welcome the casino with open arms. Were these folks that originally may have been skeptical? I, I would say, uh, I can't say if they're originally skept or they were originally skeptical, but I can tell you now with more light that has been shed on the subject, all the court cases that have been won, they're certainly in more inclined to, to, uh, you know, to lend a, a, a listening ear. So they're more inclined to lend a listening ear, and, and it sounds as though the, the, uh, the council, uh, most of the council at least, yes. seems to be softening its stance a bit. Where, where do we go from here? Well, this is where we go. Um, first of all, let's look at the economic impact and the impact with jobs. 6,000 construction jobs the very first year, 3,500 permanent jobs thereafter, not only at the casino, but from the services that they derive from the food and beverage industry, the linens, the beef they need. So this will absolutely be incredible for providing jobs in the West Valley. So last question, your gut feeling, will there be a casino on that land? Well, my gut feeling is 
I'm not willing to roll the dice because I don't gamble, but at the end of the day, if you do, this is a sure thing. <laughs> All right. And I guess if you're going to gamble, you might as well go there. Yes, Councilman, it's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We Thank appreciate you for it. having me. You bet. And tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, the state legislative session is in its hectic final few days. We'll hear from Democratic leaders in the House and Senate to get their take on the session. That's Tuesday evening at 5.30 and 10, right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.